Welcome back to Case of the Sunday Scaries. I'm Elise, and today we are continuing our look into the terrifying case of Lori Vallow. We left off last week with a 911 call from Alex Cox, Lori's brother, saying that he had shot and killed his brother-in-law, Charles Vallow, in self-defense. Spoiler alert, guys. The police for a while actually believed this was an act of self-defense, a domestic argument that had escalated, leaving another with the terrible choice of taking someone's life in order to defend themselves. I think when you see the events leading up to Charles Vallow being shot and what happened in the moments, days, and weeks after, it will become painfully clear that Alex Cox murdered his brother-in-law and Lori was the psychotic mastermind behind it all. Let's go back a bit in our timeline where we have to introduce yet another character into this story, Zulima Pastenez. Zulima apparently shared an interest in the end times with Lori. She was also a very devout member of the LDS Church. She even traveled with Lori to Utah to that conference where Lori met Chad for the first time. Over the next few months, she would attend meetings where Chad would tell her that she was indeed a light being and that in a past life, she had been Lori's daughter. Now, all of this sounds like absolute nonsense to me, but keep in mind, this is someone who reveres Chad and Lori as spiritually enlightened beings. Being told you are a daughter of someone so closely connected to God probably aided in developing a sense of love, admiration, affection, and honestly, the desire to protect her spiritual mother, according to Chad, Lori. Lori and Zulema and a few like-minded friends began performing what they called castings on Charles. From my understanding, this is basically a long-distance exorcism trying to remove the dark spirits from Charles. But that evil spirit, Ned, didn't seem to want to budge. I think all of this was Lori's way of manipulating the people around her into seeing her side. Lori texted with Zulema, and amongst other things that were quite questionable, she made a comment that Charles was blocking her spiritual gifts. It seems that Lori and Chad already had decided that Charles was a zombie that had been taken over by dark spirits named Ned and Hippos, and he needed to be taken out. Why else on June 21st, 19 days before Charles was murdered, was Lori looking up the Social Security benefit information for Charles Vallow? Benefits that would be passed down in his death to his children. Benefits Lori would be entitled to. We already know that Charles suspected Lori and Chad of having an affair and outing them to Chad's wife, Tammy. He wrote Tammy about the affair, but it's unclear if she ever received or responded. He wrote, My name is Charles Vallow. I have some vital and disturbing information regarding your husband and my wife, Lori. You can call me or email me. I apologize for being the one sending this, but something has to be done. He also wrote Charles an email confronting him about the affair as well. Infidelity aside, Charles was still really concerned about his wife's mental health and contacted her older brother Adam to share his concerns with him. He even arranged to fly Adam in and together they would try to have an intervention with Lori to get her some help. Unfortunately, it seems like good old Janice, Lori's mother, let it slip to Lori what was going on. On the morning of July 11th, 2019, at 7.35 a.m., Charles Vallow drove to Lori's home to pick JJ up for school. When he arrived, Charles texted Adam, Alex is here, and Adam responded, they're up to something, and Charles Vallow's last text would read, absolutely, because 14 minutes later at 7.49 a.m., Lori took Charles's vehicle and cell phone and left the home with JJ and Tylee. Lori is seen in CCTV footage getting food at a Burger King drive through going to Walgreens to get flip-flops for her and Tylee and dropping JJ off at school before returning home. Alex placed that 911 call at 8.32. He said on that call that the shooting had just taken place. However, when Tylee was interviewed by police, she said that as she left the home, she heard what she thought at the time was a bat falling to the floor, but knew now that it was a gunshot. So Alex let Charles lie there, two bullets, one to his stomach and one to his chest, dying on the floor for over half an hour before he ever made the call to 911. Not only that, but in part one, and if you haven't listened to part one, I'm sorry, you're probably pretty confused right now. Pause this, go back and listen. But Alex is being walked through how to perform CPR by 911 dispatchers. I shortened that 911 call. 
The 911 dispatcher walked him through chest compressions multiple times while police and ambulance were en route. And you can hear every single time Alex is exerting himself like he's performing CPR. The whole point of chest compressions is to get the heart pumping. And what does the heart pump? Blood. So then why, when emergency personnel got there and performed CPR, was it the first time they saw blood coming from Charles Vallow's body? Because Alex never wanted Charles to survive this. That is why he waited 43 minutes before calling 911. And that is why he probably was pretending to do life-saving chest compression on God knows what, probably a sofa pillow, instead of Charles Vallow. Let's talk about this nonsensical self-defense claim. I'm going to outright ignore what Lori said in her police statement, as we already know that she's a liar and a manipulator. I did watch the 26-minute interview with her, and it's eerie to say the least. Her husband was just killed, and she's completely calm and completely emotionless. But here is Tylee's own words about the events of that morning. Hi. Hi. So you have to spell your name because we're all taking guesses on how to spell it, and we're not sure. T-Y-L-E-E. Okay, that was right. And what's your last name? Ryan, R-Y-A-N. Okay, so I know this is going to kind of sound like kind of a silly question um, because it's super broad, but can you basically tell me what happened today? So I woke up probably around like 7.50, I want to say, because I heard yelling from like right outside my door. I don't even know where, but I immediately, like, jumped up, and I have a baseball bat because when I was living at my uncle's by myself, I just wanted something to, like, Mm -hmm. feel safer, and I'm not old enough to get, like, pepper spray or anything, so I was like, okay, I'll get a baseball bat. So I have that. I immediately just jumped up, and I grabbed my baseball bat, and I opened the door, and it was my stepdad, you know, outside the doorway, and then my uncle kind of in the doorway, and then I could hear my mom behind him, and he was just screaming at both of them, like, I don't even know what he was saying, because honestly, I was just too, like, like, wired, I guess, Mm -hmm. so I told him to take a few steps back, I was like, you're too close, you need to step back, and he was like, don't tell me what to do, and I just kind of just stood there, and then my uncle kind of moved out of the way, and then my mom kind of went past him and into, like, the big room okay. where everything happened. I didn't do anything with the base on that. I kind of just held it there. And he was getting really close to my mom, so I kind of stuck it out, like, between them. And they were both just yelling. And he was like, if you hit me with that base on that, you're going to go to jail. And I just kind of stood there with the base on that, and I just, I didn't really say anything. When you said they were yelling, who was yelling? My, it was mostly my stepdad. Okay. My mom was kind of, like, responding Mm -hmm. but I honestly couldn't tell you what they were saying it was kind of just like all jumbled up in my head and so I just kind of stuck the baseball bat out there and then he like he just grabbed it and tried to take it so I held on to the end and then eventually I fell and he kind of took it into his hands like he was going to do something with it and that's when so when you fell he ended up with the bat yeah okay and so I fell to the ground And then my uncle, I saw him take a step back. My uncle, I think, grabbed him and kind of took him back so he couldn't, like, do anything. You saw your stepdad, like, take a step back? Take a step back, because he was really close to begin with. And so my mom said to go with JJ. And so I ran out the door, and then I kind of just stood there with my little brother. Just, he was in the front seat of the car, and so I just kind of opened the door and just stood there and, like, He was trying to get out, and I was like, no, we have to stay, like, just stay here, and then eventually my mom came out, Mm -hmm. and then we left from there. Okay. Do you know what happened inside of the house as your mom kind of explained it all to you? I just kind of asked her, like, because I heard a noise, Mm -hmm. which I know what it was now, but it sounded like, because I knew that the base when I was in there, it sounded like someone, like, took it and hit it really hard against the floor. Okay. Um, And so I was kind of like, like, I was okay, right, because that's my uncle. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure that, like, my stepdad didn't do anything to my uncle and stuff. And so she was like, no, like, I was fine. Like, we're just going to take JJ to school. And I was like, okay. So I just got in the car. And then we went to Burger King because my little brother wanted breakfast, Mm -hmm. which was chicken fries Mm -hmm. for no reason. Okay. I do dinner for breakfast all the time. (laughs) Breakfast for dinner and dinner for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So 
To kind of back up a little bit, when you say you didn't want him to do anything, what did you think he was going to do? Hit her. Okay. But there have been a few, like, violent times with him when I was really scared that he was going to hit me or hit my mom, like, okay. just because everything was kind of crazy. Me and him have always kind of not gotten along, mm -hmm. like, just since I was little. And so there have been a few times that we've gotten in fights and stuff like that. And so, yeah, so okay. I'm just kind of always scared of that. Yeah, and then, um, so that happened, and he, he grabbed the bat from you. Mm -hmm. So kind of tell me that again real quick. So I kind of stuck it out, and this is when he was like, if you hit me with that baseball bat, you're going to jail, and I didn't say anything because I'm like, okay. And so he kind of took it, and I kind of like lunged forward and kind of lost like my footing. Mm -hmm. And so my mom was like, just let go. And then from that, my mom said to go to the car, so I just got up and ran out the door. Okay, did you see, when you when you fell towards your side, did you see what he did with the bat? No, I wasn't really looking okay. in that direction because from where I fell, the door was kind of more in my line of vision because I fell looking this way and the door was like right there, so I didn't look back. So he was kind of, he was at a different line of sight than what you were looking at. Yeah. Okay. And then at some point you saw him kind of take a step back. And from what you're saying, and tell me if I'm wrong or not, you didn't necessarily see your uncle pulling back, but yeah. it seems like that may be... What it seems like he wouldn't have taken a step back on his own. So okay. it's more of an assumption than anything. Okay. I didn't see him physically take him back. And... Does that make sense based on where your uncle was at that time? Yeah, he was behind him because okay. he wasn't on this side with me and my mom, so he okay. was behind him. Okay. Because that's kind of just the order where everyone walked out. So when that happened and then your mom told you to go, did you see what happened with your stepdad and uncle? No. Okay. And then once you went outside with your brother, you never came back inside? Oh, I went to go get my mom's purse okay. from inside so that we could have like her wallet and everything but this was all happening like I said like in the bigger room right here and so this is I went through the garage door mm -hmm. and so the garage door is right here and then there's like a little hallway and then this is kind of where everything is and then this is my mom's room okay. so when I went in I kind of like just tuned everything out ran to my mom's closet ran back so I didn't see anything and mm -hmm. hear anything when did you go back in and get her purse um, after my mom came out. Okay, so after you heard that loud noise. Yeah. Okay, so when you heard the loud noise, was your mom outside or inside? Um, kind of thing. I think she was inside when it happened and the door opened like immediately after. Okay. So very quickly after the door opened. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't like a long period of time because I remember not like thinking about it for that long and if my mom hadn't come out immediately I would have you know, been thinking about it for a lot longer than okay. I had. So, can you tell me kind of where the three of them were at emotionally and how they were behaving when all this was happening? So, my stepdad was like, I don't even know how to explain it. He honestly just looked like kind of a crazy person. Okay. Like, screaming and like his face was beat red. He just looked like really mad. I remember when he took the bat from me, I saw his face for like a split second, and I honestly, like, it didn't even look like him. He just looked like pure, like, rage. Uh -huh. Like, he was just seeing red. So, I haven't really seen him, like, all the way like that before. That's, like, the craziest I've ever seen him. And then my uncle was kind of calm. Like, not super calm, obviously. It was, like, a stressful situation, mm -hmm. but he's, like, I don't know, he was kind of just standing there in the doorway, kind of just being protective of my mom, but mm -hmm. not, he wasn't yelling or really saying anything, okay. and my mom was just kind of, he was yelling, and my mom was kind of just, like, talking. Okay, but you don't remember, if you do, like, what your mom was saying at all, or what, what he was mad about? No, not really, I'm sorry. Okay. It's okay. Honestly, like, I... We're, we're talking about something that probably happened over two seconds of time. So. Yeah, honestly, it feels it feels like two seconds and 40 minutes at the same time. Yeah, I don't remember what they were really saying. I just kind of heard yelling over everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I kind of just do that whenever things are, like, really loud. I kind of just, like, tune mm -hmm. what people are saying out because, I don't know, just yelling isn't fun obviously for a kid to hear and with my biological dad I always heard him like screaming and stuff so I kind of just learned how to like tune it out. So you 
you stepped out of your room and you took the bat with you. Is there a reason why you took the bat with you? Honestly, I think that was kind of just like first instinct. Mm -hmm. Like obviously I didn't ever hit him with mm -hmm. the bat or anything like that. It was kind of just for like security, I guess, to know that I had it. I didn't do anything with it. In hindsight, I probably just shouldn't have brought it out at all because it caused more trouble. But it, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to take the bat and like do something with mm -hmm. it. It was kind of just like... I need something in my hands to like okay. feel safer. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so my kind of second dumb question is, and I, I don't know that there necessarily is, but I always kind of want to make sure, is it, is there anything that you know we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you about or anything that you think is important or anything that I should know? That was pretty much it. But here's the part that really should have thrown the police for a loop. That light bulb moment of, well, this doesn't seem like normal human behavior. What did Lori do after knowing her husband was shot by her brother? She packed up the kids and got out of there. She ran some errands and got JJ off to school. I can maybe even give her the grace of, well, maybe she was in shock and just reverted to her normal day-to-day -day going through the motion activities. But, and this is a big but, after she and Tylee talked to police, and no arrests were made, everyone's back at the house, I repeat, at the home where the children's father and stepfather had been shot twice and laid on the floor dying just earlier that morning. Well, according to neighbors, Lori threw a pool party. Good thing she stopped on the way back home from her husband's murder to purchase those flip-flops, I guess. I've said on this podcast almost every episode that you can't really judge someone based on their reactions or emotions following something tragic everyone responds differently. I have even confided in you all that I naturally will make sarcastic jokes, maybe even inappropriate jokes when there's a difficult moment, because I have a bizarre need to take the weight off those around me, even momentarily. I just need to let the air out of the tension balloon a little bit. However, Lori Vallow is the exception to me saying all of this. Her actions don't scream guilty. She was, after all, not the person that pulled the trigger. But playing hostess with the mostest and throwing a late night pool party certainly doesn't seem like the actions of a woman who just lost the man she's been married to and claimed to love for the past 13 years. And why should it? Lori Vallow was not grieving. She was celebrating. Ned, Hippos, Charles, whatever she was calling him at this point, was now gone. You can see just how heartless this woman is because yet again, she doesn't notify his family right away. When Joe Ryan passed, she didn't even bother to call his sister or parents. But with Charles, who had two older sons from his previous marriage, she thought the pool party was more important than notifying them, apparently, because it was not until the next day she sent them a group text that their father had died. Keep in mind, Lori and Charles had been married for 13 years. She knew these boys. She had a relationship with his sons. But they didn't even deserve a phone call, a FaceTime. No. Instead, they got a very cryptic, at best, series of text messages that would not start until 4.36 p.m., more than 24 hours after their father was murdered. Lori writes, Hi, boys. I have very sad news. Your dad passed away yesterday. I'm working on making arrangements, and I'll keep you informed with what's going on. I'm still not sure how to handle things. Just want you to know that I love you, and so did your dad. Obviously, the boys immediately responded. Lori, what happened? Where is he? What happened? Lori responds, I'll call you when I can, bub. He is here in Arizona. Where in Arizona? When did this all happen? How's JJ doing? What funeral home is he at? Lori, what the happened? You can't just tell us our dad died and disappear. You're not too busy to just let us know he died and disappear. Lori, it's been three hours. You're not that busy. I don't care what you're doing. Lori responds, I'm sorry you were so upset. I'm so upset too. I'm trying to get JJ ready for bed. I'm waiting to hear back from the medical examiner to make sense out of all of this myself. Please be patient with me. It's a crushing situation all the way around. I'm still trying to process it too and what it means for JJ. For the next four days, the boys continued to press Lori, asking repeatedly over and over what happened to their father. Lori knows what happened to their dad, but never once in this exchange of messages 
did she ever tell them that he had been shot. Most of the time, she left them on red. It ignores their pleas to know what happened to their father. Five days later, she writes them this. These are your dad's wishes. He and I discussed this a lot over the years we had been together. My plan is to have him cremated as he wished and then take all five of you kids to Hawaii to spread his ashes. She then continues to ply them with platitudes about how much she and Charles loved them. You know what Lori did have time to do? Who she did have time to text? Chad freaking Daybell. In fact, Chad Daybell decided to write out a number of long messages to Lori. A love story, if you will. Their love story, in fact, but cautious to change their names in the story to James and Elena. Now, I've been known to enjoy a good His Throbbing Loins romance novel once in a while, but reading through this, it made me cringe. Chad began sending this love story two days after Charles was murdered. I won't make you suffer through the entirety of his text, but I do think it's important to read excerpts because it gives you a little insight into the beliefs these two seem to share about their religious importance and the importance that they had together, no matter what the cost. In chapter one, yes, this man texted her chapters. Chad writes, James had glimpses of them walking dusty paths together, and he realized they had been married during the life of Jesus Christ, and they had been very close to him. At this time, their spirits could not be restrained any longer, and a long-awaited makeout session took place in that lobby. This was a manifest in the mortal world to James and Elena through the scientific phenomenon known as loin fire. Oh my gosh, I must have missed this loin fire reference the first time I read this. Why are everyone's loins on fire? Good grief. Anyways, it goes on to say, As they talked, James had a burning desire to make love to her, but he wasn't sure she felt the same way. But they could not stay away from each other. The erotic tension continued throughout the afternoon. James could only think of her. His desire for her was indescribable. Thankfully, she had worn 16 layers of clothing to survive the 80-degree weather, so he was not fully aware that she truly had the body of a goddess. Her dimensions were exactly what he had always fantasized about, but that revelation would have to wait a month. Okay, I take it back. In episode one, I said I only had one thing in common with Lori. Well, I guess I have another thing in common because no matter the weather, you will always find me in a hoodie. Let's go through some poignant excerpts from chapter two. This is where Charles continued to heavily point out that they belonged together and could only complete their mission if they were together. He writes, During that first phone conversation with Elena, James realized she already had a strong understanding of the many truths he had been taught regarding how the universe really worked. The loin fire, oh gosh, okay. The loin fire and obsession with each other had no real explanation unless they truly had a spiritual connection before this light. He was able to help clarify many of the promptings and impressions that she had felt in recent years. She knew she had lived on earth before, and James was able to clarify when. They had been married before on this earth, and other times on a previous earth. Their love truly spanned the universe and eons of time. They knew the Lord had brought them together again for a crucial mission that only they could accomplish as a united couple. They would both attend the same event in mid-November, and it seemed like that day would never arrive. Each day they opened their hearts to each other a little more. James knew he could trust her with the mysteries of the universe that had been revealed to him. He knew that they had been married before, and they had been close friends with the Savior when he lived in Jerusalem. James had served an important position in the Lord's Church, and Elena had been his beloved spouse and best friend. That relationship was now meant to continue in this lifetime. In Jerusalem, James and Elena had enjoyed tremendous intimacy. Their physical desire for each other was unmatched, and they were fortunate that they could be alone morning, noon, and night, and they seized every chance to passionately express their love for each other. They simply could never get enough, even after many years of marriage. Everyone knew they were crazy about each other. They were a wonderful example of how spouses should cleave together in love and unity. James and Elena had agreed to visit the temple the following morning. They returned to the hotel room, and after additional romance on the couch, they calmed their nerves enough to give each other a blessing. Is that what you call it, Chad? As James placed his hands on her head, he connected with Elena's true eternal self. He knew he was in the presence of an exalted goddess, 
who would return to Earth to perform a special mission. This mission included being with him, and together they would progress as translated beings. The full plan wasn't yet completely clear to him, but the immense power radiating from her confirmed his belief that she was among the greatest women in the universe. If you're a masochist, you can go ahead and read the rest of this nausea-inducing story at the link in our show notes. But as for me, my dad listens to this podcast. I think that's about enough of him having to uh, listen to me narrate the love story of these two terrible humans and their multiple references to their lowing fire. I don't know what psychological diagnosis these two would have if they were evaluated, but it doesn't take a master's degree to hear these writings and know that this, at minimum, is more than a little toxic. It's pathological. It's one thing to call yourself a child of God, but to think you are so special that it doesn't matter who you hurt, who you kill, because nothing is more important than the two of you being together. Yeah, something is wrong here. I also want to point out that according to the LDS website, www.churchofjesuschrist.org, Mormons do believe in the Ten Commandments. So what makes Chad and Lori so special that God wanted them specifically to ignore one-fifth of those commandments? Thou shall not kill is ironically for these two immediately followed by thou shall not commit adultery. So let's go back to the timeline. Lori has been ignoring Charles' kids, but throwing pool parties and responding to Chad's text message novels with how much she loved his story. Puke. She also made sure that she had enough time to call Charles' life insurance policyholder. Claims Department, this is Robin. May I have the policy number? Sure. It is... Are you calling in reference to a death claim? Yes. May I have the name of the insured? L. Charles Vallow. And who am I speaking with? This is Lori Vallow. And your relationship to the insured? Um, he's my husband. Okay, ma'am. I'm just going to need to ask you a few questions so that I can open the claim and then I can go over the claim procedure with you and answer any questions that you may have afterwards. That would be great. Okay. Um, first of all, what was the date of Mr. Vallow's passing? Um, July 11th. And what was the cause of his passing? Um, well, he was shot. Okay. So um, I don't know what, how I want to put that. Okay. All right. Um, I, and I hate to ask, um, but is it, yeah, you can just say yes or no. Um, it, is it, was it a homicide? No, it was an accident. An accident, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what state did he pass away in? Arizona. Okay. Are you aware of who the primary beneficiary of the policy is? Um, it's me. I hope desperately that Charles Vallow's spirit was hearing this conversation between Lori and the life insurance rep and laughing his ass off. Because if you remember, Charles had taken precautions before his passing. Lori started spouting off all this crazy nonsense and he was like, okay, I've got to protect myself here. And Lori would soon find out that the $1 million life insurance policy she thought she had coming her way, Charles had removed her from it and put his sister Kay Woodcock as the beneficiary. A week after Charles was murdered on July 18th, Lori texted back and forth with Chad. Lori, I just got the letter from the insurance company saying I'm not the beneficiary. It's a spear through my heart. Who do you think it was changed to? Brandon? Or probably Kay? He left nothing for JJ. Chad. Wow, that's terrible. There's no way to find out. Lori. I might be able to see when I get his computer on Sunday. I could check the emails I sent to the insurance company. It will show change of beneficiary. He must have done it recently. I want to point out that Lori is talking about the email she sent to the insurance company. Because in fact, before Charles was killed, we would come to find out that Lori had changed the passwords and login information to Charles' insurance information. But of course, he's going to be notified of this, realized it, and changed it back himself. Chad, it seems you would have to agree to the change. Maybe your name was forged. You should have a good paper trail to prove it. I love you. This is terrible, but it is probably another step in bringing the Gadiatons, especially Brandon. Brandon was Melanie's husband. Remember, Melanie is Lori's niece. We're going to get back to them a little bit later. Chad, it will be interesting if it got changed after he had two bullets to his chest. Lori, I talked to the insurance company. He changed it in March. Ned, before we got rid of him. 
They can't tell me who, of course. I'll still get the $4,000 a month from Social Security. Chad, I have been instructed to now focus my efforts on Hillary. That same day, Chad texted Lori about Lori's beautiful daughter, Tylee, who she believed, because of Chad's self-proclaimed ability to rate people on a lighter dark scale, had been taken over by dark spirits. That spirit's name was Hillary. So Chad had now been instructed to focus his efforts on Tylee? Chad wrote Lori, I turned up the pain to a 10 and placed a spiritual virus inside of her. Lori was not making arrangements for a family trip to Hawaii like she had indicated to Charles Vallow's sons. Because by the end of July, she was too busy packing up her home in Arizona to move closer to Chad Daybell in Idaho. Also, Chad had prophecies that, ironically enough, Rexburg, Idaho would be where him and Lori would leave the 144,000 in the end times. We already know that Chad believed he could see through the veil from the mortal world to the spiritual world. We know that he believed him and Lori had been married previously and were buddy-buddy with Jesus in another life and destined to carry out some wild end times mission together. We also know that he believed he could rate people's souls as light and dark. What I have not told you yet is how Chad rated people. He consulted a necklace. Yes, you heard me right. A zombie identifying necklace. Chad told people that he had found the necklace when he was cleaning the temple after service. But instead of being a decent human and turning it into the temple's lost and found, he says that a spirit came to him to tell him that this necklace had special powers just for him and that it would help him determine who would be with him as he led the 144,000. Using his little wizard sorting necklace, Chad came to the conclusion that there was a rating system of souls from 1 to 6 light and 1 to 6 dark. 6 light being really amazing, 6 dark was the worst of the worst. He believed that anyone with a ranking of 2 or 3 could switch sides during their mortal life. Anyone with a ranking of 4.1, very specific, or more light or dark generally had made a covenant with their side and it would be very difficult to switch sides. This is ironic then that when he emailed Lori her rating in this life as well as her past lives, he also included a rating of Ty Lee as 4.1 dark, Charles Vallow as 3 light, and JJ Vallow as a 4.2 light. So I guess just being a lowly 3, Charles could switch over to the dark side. But for JJ, it should have been very difficult to be anything but goodness personified, right? Well, I guess Chad's talisman necklace would soon be telling him something very different about young J.J. Vallow's soul. Chad believed that he could not only rate people's spiritual standings, but also would use percentages to explain how close to death they were. The closer that percentage was to zero, the closer that person was to meeting their death. On July 30th, Chad texted Lori that his wife Tammy Daybell was at a 3% and that Lori and Charles' adopted son JJ was at a 2%. Instead of being appalled, outraged that anyone would be saying their son is close to death, Lori responded, 2 and 3%? Not zero? Okay, still feeling hot for you. I'm going to pause here and give you a warning. The following texts between Chad and Lori are very painful for me to read, but they are also terrible to hear, especially for those that know what is to come. I will include a timestamp in the show notes for those that want to skip ahead. Just as they had named Hillary as the dark spirit who had overpowered Tylee, Blake was the name that they gave the spirit trying to overtake JJ to the dark side. On August 10th, the two exchanged these messages. Lori, please check JJ. He woke up saying crazy stuff and won't go back to sleep. He is talking to Blake. Chad. JJ is still JJ. I am told his spirit recognizes Blake as evil and is unsettled by him. Chad. Hey, my love, how is JJ now? Lori. He's better. He was just up talking nonsense for like two hours last night. I'm sure the spirits were bugging him. Is he at a zero yet? I miss you. Chad. Yes, he's at zero. He was probably through the veil, talking to both light and dark. Lori. Maybe he was talking to the real Blake. Chad. Yes, that was the real Blake. Lori. Do you think there is a perfectly orchestrated plan to take out the children? We just have to wait for it to be carried out? I feel lost, like I should be doing something to help. Chad. 
There is a plan being orchestrated for the children. I was shown last night how it would fit together, but it has been taken from my mind, of course. Lori, what should I be doing? Chad, you are doing everything right, my love. The Lord told me she is on track. He said to just keep resolving the telestial issues so that you are unencumbered and fully free. Lori, that actually feels good that JJ was talking to the real Blake. Getting close. I sensed he was barely attached to his body. Chad, you are so incredible in many ways. Your mission has barely begun. Lori, as long as it ends with you, it's all good. Chad, yes, cheek to cheek, loin to loin. It isn't very far away now, my love. Lori, I can't wait. Literally can't wait. I have no patience. I want you now. Chad, well, I'm certainly your biggest fan. I love you. Hold on, sweet angel. We are so close to the finish line. On September 3rd, when Tylee, JJ, Lori, and Alex Cox had all moved to Rexburg, Idaho, Alex texted his sister Lori the sign-in information for the Wi-Fi service they had set up, as well as about the children who they now referred to as zombies, believing the dark spirits had taken over their human physical bodies. Alex, the network name is Anti-Lawman. The password is Too Many Kids. Lori responded, Funny! Alex, and I can change it to whatever you want if you want to change it. I am proud of you. No more zombies. Lori, we are trying to get to the bottom of what we need to do to eliminate them completely. I'm sure you will be told also. Alex responded, excellent. On September 9th, 2019, JJ, Lori, and Tylee would visit Yellowstone National Park. The photos from that day show Tylee, just a few weeks shy of her 17th birthday, lovingly embracing her brother JJ, who is now seven years old. This would be the last time Tylee Ryan was seen alive. And that is where we will be picking up next week in part three of this case. Just when you think this story truly cannot get any more tragic, any more depraved, it does. I hope you join me later this week as we sort through the next chapter of this tangled web, a web that will ultimately end with six people connected to Lori Vallow meeting a tragic end. But as always, until then. 